Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Spirits and Ghost Stories. I'm your host, Carly Bird. And I'm Thomas Ahrens. Week 14, which is the spookiest week of the year so far for us, right? 14. This is our Halloween episode. Halloween episode 14. We have been building and building. And if you do not tell for the people, Carly, look at the camera. Carly, what are you going dressed as this year? So this year, I'm a beautiful butterfly. See my wings. Watch me flutter. You look very elegant. Thank you. And I am going as a witch doctor. Completely to different. all of your fans out there. On the opposite spectrum. I know, but I am looking quite... Um, Dapper. Yes, actually. actually, dapper is the word I was going to go with. Yeah. Uh, we thought we'd just have fun with this, guys. This is the best holiday, in my opinion, all year. Whether you're five years old or you're, or you're 40 or 50, you can find fun in this. Whether it's like trick-or-treating when you're a kid or going to college parties or adult parties when you're older and dressing up and being Seriously, just silly. Halloween is the best holiday out of the entire year. It's the greatest holiday. You can always find enjoyment in it. No matter how old you are, whether it's bonfires and cuddling with your first date on a crackling October evening, going to a haunted house with your significant other, or just staying up late watching some creepy, goofy movies with some friends or your or your loved ones. I would love to do that right now. It's all about, it's the greatest time of year. It's it, mood for me. And it's mood. the last thing I want to say to make sure this is the greatest holiday is the weather's always great. Yeah. Best weather of the year is usually in October. Yeah. Nice, cool, crisp weather. Mm-hmm leaves depending on when you are the smell now, in the air right now for us out here in the dc dc metro area it's very very windy mm. and the cold weather is just basically blustering through our our community so it's um it's finally getting cold and i had to put on my heavy jacket to go outside i know it's a, it's, it's getting a little too cold a little too fast like yep. please back it off back yeah, it off a little like, bit whoa hold but, on I want to say though, thank you to the makeup crew, which is my beautiful wife, for this because I am, I'm dapper as fuck. I guess a little underwear I'm representing Isn't here. Is hot? I know, right? Thank you. I look amazing. I don't want to look amazing. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for for amazing. telling me I'm amazing. Dude, he even has his bracelet on. Guys. I do, uh, guys. Bracelet, everything. I bracelet, am makeup, ready for the Halloween hat, season. And his, I don't even know what to call it. His jacket. And a huge shout out to. Uh, Loudoun County community for uh, picking, finding me this bone necklace. It was amazing. Um, and honestly, like, oh, our studio is completely done. One of our cameras is going to pick up the lovely art we have behind both of our heads now. Yeah. It's amazing. We have a black light The Wendigo in the background, the witch doctor oh, summoning the spirits. So cool. Our glow in the dark symbol behind my head, the pumpkin behind you. We're done, baby. I know. The studio is done and it looks amazing. It's so cool. I'm obsessed. So before I get into, because I, as the witch doctor, am presenting tonight. Carly, what are we drinking? So we are drinking my typical go-to 14 hands red wine. It's kind of a dry wine. It's called Hot to Trot 2018 Columbia Valley. And, um kind of what i just pick up anytime i'm at the liquor store i'm like mm, i could use another one of those so i just grab another one of my uh, 14 hands hot to try yeah it's a fantastic red line sadly uh we are at a wine glass shortage at our house right now so we are sharing one veil or cauldron as you will they're in the dishwasher right now i thought that i would go with a, a deeper darker story oh. a very halloweeny story okay today's gonna be a little bit longer episode than usual we might be pushing a little bit longer than we usually do. But hopefully at the end of this, you won't be able to sleep tonight. Oh, hopefully. Because part of what we're going to talk about tonight happened. It was a documented murder with bodies. But yet from it spawned novels and a couple of horror movies. But what I'm going to talk about now, the people that live through it swear this happened. This is from one of the autobiographies of what happened. Okay. But beforehand, I'm going to get a little backdrop of this sinister thing. And of course, I'm talking about Amneville. Oh, Amneville. So the story begins in, at roughly 3.15 a.m. on November 13, 1974, 23-year-old Ronald Joseph Butch DeFeo Jr. 
took a 35 caliber Marlin rifle, and a few hours before dawn, Butch used this rifle to execute every single member of his immediate family. All of them were sleeping at the DeFeo family home at 112 Ocean Avenue, Amityville, Long Island, New York. Ronald J. DeFeo Sr. was 43. His wife, Lois, was 42. Two of their sons, John, who was nine, and Mark, who was 12, and two of their daughters, Alice, 13, and Dawn, 18. All of them were found shot to death over 12 hours later. Mm. Why don't you get up those photos on your phone? I see them. Because those are exact photos. I gave her photos of the crime scene that, they, that these bodies were found in. This happened. When law enforcement arrived 12 hours later, they found it didn't take long. When Butch showed up at Henry's Bar, a local tavern near his home at approximately 6.30 p.m., he shouted to everyone, You've got to help me. Help, help. I think my mother and father are shot. When law enforcement arrived 12 hours later, they found it didn't take long for a jury to convict Butch of murder after he was arrested. Law enforcement found that Mr. and Mrs. DeFeo had each been shot twice, and all four of their children had been shot one time each for a total of eight shots fired that night. It was a slam dunk case, you'd think, right? Now, here's where things get a little spooky, and this is where it not only becomes a murder scene, but I think this is where the paranormal part before our story even begins. Mm. There are a lot of unanswered questions about this murder. And I want you to look at those pictures again, but not yet. How, on November 13th, 1974, did Ronald Joseph Butch DeFeo Jr. shoot six different people in four different rooms on two different floors without waking anybody up? Mm -hmm. And this is what's creepy, because this is what I found out in the research. Butch shot each of his parents twice in the head. That's four shots. Okay. He shot all four of his siblings one time each. How many shots is that? Eight. No, no one four. woke up. Four siblings, four times. And then two for each of his parents. Mm, yeah. None of them woke up. That's weird. And you'd be thinking, like, well, what? There's something that's going on. Right. Well, the investigation came to the conclusion that there was no silencer used. Okay. Then that's even weirder. And the investigating cops had this to say. They came to the conclusion that no silencer was used in the murders. The rifle used, though, was a Marlin 35 caliber, normally used for hunting larger games such as feral hogs and deer. It's a loud fucking rifle. Mm -hmm. So you'd think somebody would have heard something about this. True. But based on the crime scene, none of the victims struggled or were awakened from their sleep. Mm -hmm. How, then, does one sleep through several rifle shots without noticing? Right, in the same house. Former Amityville police chief was one of the first law enforcement professionals at the scene, and he thinks it is impossible that anyone could sleep through that night. He suspects that the victims were drugged. However, on further investigation by autopsy of every single person there, there were no drugs in any of the bodies of the victims. Mm. Furthermore, the neighbors on either side of the house were home when the murder supposedly took place, and none of them heard anything. And yet, they were all found face down on their beds. Hmm. This is all in medical journals and in police reports. Those are medical pictures I showed you. So yeah. if you look at those pictures again. Yeah, everybody's, everybody's face, face down. So they were he took back. a deer rifle, went into each single room and shot them, and no one woke up mm -hmm. without drugs or a silencer. That's fucking creepy mm -hmm. because that's a loud noise. That's a, that's a, we all shot rifles in this part right. of the country. Obviously. Like so you and I wake up in the middle of the night when like thunder is going on outside. Or Kirby growls. Right. So with that said, was there something insidious that changed the way sound traveled that night? What's even more creepy, creepy is Butch DeFeo Jr., the one who committed the murders, claimed in court, documented that he heard voices in his head that night urging him to commit these atrocities. Oh, no. And that he felt an unevil presence in a cloaked figure that he saw. What did the voices reveal? 
What if the voices were connected to the unexplained lack of sound that would have come with the atrocities committed that night? This could explain the hauntings that would plague the next family to move into this house. Mm. What happened to the Lutz family after moving into this same house would inspire the 1977 book and a movie of the same name in 1979 and a further movie in the late 2000s, Amityville Horror, Amityville Horror, The True Story, and The Conjuring 2. Mm -hmm. This Conjuring 2. What we are about to talk about now is the firsthand account of what the family believed they saw that night and what spurred America's obsession with paranormal. This is the tale of the demons of Amityville. The Lutz family moved into the DeFeo house less than two years after the murders of 1975, and they would only last in that house for 28 days. Keep that number in mind. Hmm. In their new home, in the new home, George Lutz was 28. His wife, Kathy, was 29. They moved into the Annieville house with Kathy's three kids from a previous marriage, of course. Danny was nine. Christopher was seven. Melissa, also known as Missy. That's important, so you should pay attention. I'm My little late. No, you're not. My little late cheaty child. Melissa, important. No. Also known as Messy. Missy. Who was five. George Lutz was 28. His wife, Kathy, was 29. They moved into Amityville with Kathy's three kids from a previous marriage. Mm. Danny, who was nine, Christopher, who was seven, and Melissa, who also goes by Missy, who was five. They also had a lab named Harry. Mm. The house was a three-story, five-bedroom Dutch colonial that sat on a five-by-237-acre lot with a heated swimming pool and a boathouse that was located on the Amityville River, which leads out to South Oyster Bay. Damn! I like that property. The local priest, Father Frank Moncos, came over to Lutz's new home on that same day. Frank knew about the DeFeo murders, and he knew that Lutz had no idea what happened, but he didn't want to bring it up and startle the new family. When Father Frank entered the Lutz's new home, he felt something. Something terrible. He strongly sensed that this presence was not welcomed in this house. And that the presence did not welcome him in it either. When he flicked the first few drops of the holy water that he brought to clean the place, an insidious, masculine voice bellowed out from the home. Get out. He spun around towards the source of the voice, startled, and although he didn't see anything, he did feel something. Something rotten. <laughs> something terrible. He quickly finished his cleansing and left without telling the family what he just heard. He didn't want to scare their young children. <laughs> He tried to convince himself it was all just in his imagination that he simply spooked himself into thinking about the murders before ever stepping through the door. Strangely, later that same day after returning to his rectory, dark circles suddenly started to form under Father Malko's eyes and he felt very ill. He wouldn't recover for weeks. Even stranger, on the way home, from his rectory that night, Father Malko's car malfunctioned and steered itself off the road and onto the shoulder. The hood flew open and smashed into the windshield. The front passenger's door flew open and the engine died. Father Malkos had to have another priest drive him home. He would later interpret all this as the entity of the Amityville house, making it very, very clear. Mm. It did not want him to return. Whatever attacked Father Mankovic that 
may have also introduced itself to the Lutz family that same day. A few hours later that same night, the first of the Lutz family stayed in the Amityville house. The dog Harry, the dog Harry nearly hung himself by jumping over a fence and was barely saved from asphyxiation by George. What was weird is he's not normally a fence jumper. George and Kathy were really surprised and chalked it up to the dog being unfamiliar with his surroundings. But the very next night, George wondered if he had been frightened. Frightened by something he had time to believe. Maybe it was something he saw. The next night, looking down from his bedroom window, George saw a shadowy figure approach Harry, who then started he started barking at. Mm. Thinking maybe it was some kind of animal, George headed outside, and while he didn't find any animal near Harry, he did find that the boathouse door was suddenly ajar. Part of him wanted to go inside to the boathouse, but a primal instinct deep inside him warned him not to. Don't go down there. Before he knew it, he just he ran back to the house. He locked the door and went back to bed. Now, backing up for a moment, this encounter wasn't the only unusual incident George experienced. During his second day in the new family house, he also couldn't get warm. He put on a second shirt and he also started a fire in the fireplace. Yet he, he still felt cold. He would feel cold the entire next day as well as feel cold for weeks and become obsessed, obsessed with trying to heat up the house. His family would also recall that George, his personality began to shift. After the second day in this home, he was suddenly irritable, on edge and moody. He, all, he also stopped showering or shaving the same day he moved in. Hmm. Something he's done on a daily basis his entire adult life. Kathy's mood also began to darken after moving into the Amityville house. It seemed like something began corrupting the entire Lutz family the moment they walked through those doors. Kathy and George ran a family land surveying business, but both stopped showing up to work once they moved in. Inexplicably, they just no longer cared about work is all just it was all just the beginning of what was going to happen in these 28 days day four George and Kathy both for the first time beat their kids with a leather strap and a wooden spoon for for cracking a pane of glass in the playroom and again neither had ever hit their kids like that before then on the fifth day, Kathy had a physical encounter with something she couldn't see. While alone in the kitchen, she felt a woman's soft hand suddenly rest on her own hands. Like a mother's touch, it was both unsettling and oddly reassuring. She would soon become so oddly attached to the house and would never want to leave it. It seemed as if the house wanted her to stay. The same day, the Lutz kids showed their mom the upstairs toilet. The inside of the toilet bowl had become covered in a black stain, as if it had been painted black. Kathy, no matter what she did, she could not get it off, no matter how hard she tried. Kathy also got a whiff of something, a smell, a strange perfume in her bedroom this day and then in her master bathroom that too that toilet also this blackness that could not be taken out and then the the perfume grew stronger a powerful rotten stench also on day five the family discovered a large swarm of flies in the sewing room clustered around the window facing the boathouse. Ew. 
hundreds of fat, slowly flying houseflies. George opened a window, and the family chased out as many as they could, and they killed the rest. George still felt cold, so cold, yet no one else in the family seemed to feel the same chill. George, is now, George was now chopping firewood every day throughout the day, constantly adding logs to the fireplace, trying to get warm. Day 6. Kathy wakes up in the middle of the night to find George trying to put the front door to the house back on. He said it had somehow come off in the middle of the night. George had, George had explained that the way the door had been busted, it was as if someone had been trying to break out of the house, not break into the house. Still on the sixth day, the paranormal activity increased. Five-year-old Missy makes an invisible friend called Jody. Missy also says she's been talking to angels around the house and that angels talk back to her. The angels tell her how much they like her and how much they never want her to leave. The same day, a crucifix that Kathy had hung up in the home is found turned upside down and strange smells continue to plague the home. Nine-year-old Daniel and seven-year-old Christopher also got into a fist fight and drew blood. And the boys had never done anything like this before. Father Mancos, Mancuso, it's Father Mancuso, my apologies. Father Mancuso was worrying about the Lux family as he, as he sat resting and he trying to recover from his mysterious illnesses. He called the family to check in with them on the seventh day and spoke to George and told George that he's been feeling bad and that he had these weird premonitions about the second floor of his house in the sewing room. He asked George if he's felt anything unusual there. George tells the priest about the hundreds of house flies that have been there in the sewing room just two days prior. Father Marconis starts to tell him he needs to keep his family out of that room. And then when he starts to say something, click. The connection cuts out. Static. <sighs> Marconis tries to call back and hears the phone ringing. Ringing and ringing for minutes on minutes. George waits for Father Marconi on the other end. But he hears nothing. <sighs> George starts to wonder, is the house playing games with what can be heard? The flies came back to the sewing room on the seventh day. George continues to obsess over the house, not being warm. He doesn't bathe. He doesn't shave. He doesn't go to work. His mood continues to darken. And he still tries to get warm. Day 8. This is Christmas Day, mm -hmm. 1975. And George, for some reason, wakes up at a peculiar time. 3.15 a.m. Does that ring a bell to you? He is actually woken up at 3.15 exactly several nights in a row mm. and each time he worries that something sinister is in the boathouse mm. late on christmas night well technically it was early december 26th he decides to go outside to check and see if the boathouse door is locked when he gets down there he finds out that the boathouse door is locked it is but when he turns back towards the house and he looks at the house, he sees his five-year-old daughter, Missy, standing in the bedroom window, looking down at him. It's approximately 3.20 a.m. in the morning, 
but behind her he sees clear as day the face of a pig no not a pig a wild boar glowing red eyes directly behind her as clear as day george runs inside and up to missy's room to find her sound asleep in her bed however the little rocking chair in the corner of her room made for her dolls to sit on was rocking back and forth back and forth back and forth like someone or something was sitting in it right now just watching her sleep george is worries he's losing his mind the next night kathy hears missy talking to her invisible friend jody in her room missy tells her brothers daniel that jody is a pig <gasps> george who still hasn't showered shaved or gone to work awakes at 3 15 a.m again early on the ninth day he checks the boathouse door again there's no pig sightings this night but he notices that the dog harry is becoming more and more lethargic barely moves when george walks past him still again on the ninth day george is sick also kathy kathy He's, she's touched in the kitchen again by an unseen entity. She smells that strange perfume she smelled in her bedroom four days earlier. Once more, and she feels a woman again touch her, this time on the waist. But there's a sweet smell, becomes heavy, and she tries to pull away from the, from the presence, and the spirit grabs her harder. <laughs> She feels a hand grab her shoulder, and then just like that, it's gone. And she starts to cry. As she cries, though, Missy shows up and tells her mom, Jody says, you shouldn't cry. Everything will be all right soon. We need to trust Jody. Day 10. On the afternoon of day 10, Kathy's aunt, Theresa, comes to visit. Theresa has been a nun at one point in time, but it didn't work out for her, and she ended up being the mother of three kids. <laughs> so, yeah, we know what happened there. Oh, okay. She takes a little tour of her niece's home, but stops dead in her tracks when she reaches the second floor in the sewing room, <laughs> saying she can't go in there. Her face turns pale as she backs away from the door slowly. Teresa says the room is ice cold, much colder than the rest of the home. Teresa says she will not go into the child's playroom on the third floor either, telling Kathy that something is very, very wrong with that room. And then less than 30 minutes after arriving, Teresa insists on leaving, telling Kathy that she should sell this place and get the fuck out. Furthermore, on day 10, the house in the house, George discovers a secret door while exploring the basement and finds a small room with a concrete blocked walls that someone had painted solid red. When he turns off the basement lights, he sees Butch DeFeo's face floating in the middle of the red room. And for some reason, seeing this face does not make George want to leave. Sometimes he fears that maybe the house, this house doesn't want me to leave. Day 11. George meets a co-worker at a bar not far from Amityville House. The same bar Butch had visited after killing his family. Unshaven, filthy, disgusting. So George actually looked a lot like Butch DeFeo did. He tells the coworker about the house and have it how it's if he walked away from the house now, he'd be in financial ruin. He couldn't leave. It would destroy him. Day twelve. On the twelfth day, George walks up with the cut with cut over his eye. He wakes up with a cut over his eye and a swollen ankle. He assumes he must have fallen during the night when he checked the boathouse and stoked the fire. 
But when Kathy looks at his injuries, he finds teeth marks on his ankle. What, what bit him that night? He has no memory of what might have happened. George read details about the murders finally and what happened in that house and quickly realizes that the murders have been taken place at roughly 3.15 a.m. Day 13. On the 13th day, things were pretty uneventful for the household. And for the first time in a long time, George and Kathy thought maybe things would get back to normal. This would be the last day of bliss they would experience. Day 14. On the 14th day, Danny and Chris threaten to run away from the home after Kathy finds them fighting again. Hmm. In their room, she finds Missy watching them fight in the corner with an oddly smirched grin on her face. Missy, who continues to talk to her friend Jody, and more flies are found swarming in the sewing room at 1 a.m. George and Kat on, uh, 15, on the 15th day, George and Kathy wake up to find their bedroom window open and a cold wind blowing into their house. Checking the rest of the home, they find other doors and windows open. The whole house is cold except for Missy's bedroom, which is as hot as a furnace. Mm -hmm. And her little rocking chair moving back and forth back and forth back and forth later that day kathy feels that female presence in the kitchen once more the smell of that strange perfume is back again she tries calling father moncuso monacuso but she feels like some other entity just entered the room and the entity near her does not want her to talk to the priest. She drops the phone and runs from the room immediately. Like her husband, she is worried that she is losing her mind. That night after turning off the lights to go to, that night after turning off the lights to go to bed, Kathy sees unblinking vivid red eyes outside the living room window staring back at her she screams and wakes up george who runs down and looks outside sees the red eyes glowing back at him bright as day but when he runs outside he can't find anything day 16 early in the morning on day 16 george walked outside to find that the door to the garage was nearly ripped off its metal hinges how could this have happened how did I not wake up and not hear this happen? Later that day, the kitchen entity reeked of perfume and something grabbed Kathy yet again. And then a second spirit grabbed her as well. And she felt that they were fighting for control of her. And without her knowing it, she passed out and woke up later on the kitchen floor. George finally went back to work again. And after he stopped at a local Animeville bar on his way home, on his way home, he stopped at a local Animeville bar. <laughs> Sorry. He ended up talking to the bartender about his house, where he moved. Bartender drew pale and stopped talking. The bartender told him that he had dreams. I'm sorry, nightmares about George's house. He stuttered. He used to have dreams, strange dreams, of groups of people that used to be in that house, that used to sacrifice dogs and pigs in some room on the second floor. George thought to himself, the sewing room, the flies, Jody the pig, the house, the hold the house seemed to have on him was weakened. Wait a minute, is it because I wasn't in the house anymore? Is this why my, I feel like I'm thinking clearer? 
I decided to try to call Father Mancuso again later that night. But yet, when I keep calling him, all I get is static. Day 17 of the 28 days. On the 17th day, George noticed a horrible stench coming from the basement red room. He decided to brick the room up so that no one could enter it again. That night, the stone lion in the sewing room bared its teeth and stared at Kathy and George as they walked past the room. This startled both of them as they walked back, but yet the statue was perfectly fine. So they shut the room and locked it, banging no one to go in there. Day 18. On the 18th day, George woke up to hear what sounded like a marching band parading through his living room. The noise was loud and bombastic, like it could wake the dead. When he got downstairs, everything was silent. And when he asked his wife, she said she, she heard nothing. George, George ran back up the stairs to check on his daughter, who was floating in midair several feet above her bed. At that point, George called Father Mancusa yet again. And this time, finally, he got through. He tells the priest about the smells, the touching, the, the red eyes. Seeing Kathy levitate, Father Mancuso agrees to head over. But then all of a sudden, I think there was a loud moan that came over the phone call. And suddenly Father Mancuso feels like he just got slapped in the face. Then the phone went dead. Static. Day 19. Another piece, another priest in Father Mancuso's rectory got a strange phone call from an eerie voice to tell Father Mancuso not to come back to the Feo house if he values his life. <laughs> Click. Static. Day 20. The weather was starting to turn cold. George and Kathy brought the family dog, Harry, inside. Missy want, wanted to play with Harry in her room with her and her friend Jody. But when the dog went into the room, the dog hid under her bed. When her brother Chris opened the door, to, Harry bolted out as fast as he could from the room and would never be convinced to go back in there again. Mm. Day 21. George woke up to find Kathy levitating above the bed. He grabbed her and pulled her back to the bed with him, but she transformed into this ugly, sinister hag with no teeth and rotting flesh. Kathy ran to the bathroom mirror and looked at herself and screamed before turning back to normal. Father Mancuso still has not come to visit the house. Instead, he calls the Lutz family and tells them to leave the house and never go back. That night, Jordan's girlfriend, who believes, I'm sorry, Kathy's girlfriend, Kathy's friend, who's a girl, Jordan, who believes in spirits and believes herself to be a psychic medium, came to Amityville to see what she could find out. She was taken to the basement. When she sees the red room, she tells George that th that she that she sees things. Let me try this again. Sorry, guys, I'm a little drunk and a little worn out here. <laughs> she sees the red room. She tells George that she that she thinks there was once a well that had been walled off at some point. She thinks it was a it was walled off to try to keep something or someone from getting inside the house. Then she went quiet and she staggered back and fell down. But I think something has already gotten in. She tells George, I, f 
feel a terrible thing has gotten in. Things have happened in this red room. And there are angry spirits here. The house needs to be exercised. <laughs> she was visibly spooked and went completely pale and started sweating. She got out of the house as fast as she could and she would never come back. Mm. Day 22. George's brother Jimmy and his new bride Carrie came over to visit and spend the night and see if they noticed any of this unusual paranormal activity. Jimmy and his wife slept in Missy's room. Everyone else went to bed, or everyone went to bed, at around 11 p.m. But at 3.15 a.m., George was awoken by Carrie screaming. He runs downstairs to Missy's room. Callie follows, and they find Jimmy comforting his wife, who says they, they, sh they were woken up when something touched her foot. She says she saw what looked like a sick little boy sitting at the foot of her bed asking her to help him. The boy asked her, where is Missy and Jody? Where? Where are they? And then the boy disappeared. George grabs a crucifix and carries it from room to room and Kathy recites the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Then a loud male voice booms. Will you stop? Day 23. Kathy tells George she wants to leave now. George falls to his knees crying, telling her they can't. He says work has been falling apart. The business is crumbling. They've lost a lot of money the past few weeks. He tells her it will financially ruin them if they walk away from this house now. In a, in a tirade, he screams at in the air around him, You suck. Get out of my house. Get the hell out of my house. Then he throws all the windows open around the house, continuing to scream for the spirits to get the hell out. Kathy worried about George. She's worried about herself. She's worried about her family. She's terrified. Day 24. Kathy wakes up with red welts that have formed a trail from above from her pubic hair all the way to underneath her breasts they feel hot to the touch as if something has slashed and burned her later that day danny screamed out as they went up to his room they found that his hands were slammed in the bedroom window george runs upstairs but he can't get the window open the kid screams out in pain and agony george takes a hammer to break the window but but, but suddenly the glass is like indestructible. He keeps swinging at it, but he cannot break it. George curses out loud at the window and at the house itself. Damn you. And suddenly the window opens all by itself. Kathy screams when he sees Danny's hands. His fingers look like they were as flat as pancakes. George tries to call the doctor, but the line is dead, static. Again, he just bails out of the house and he drives to the hospital where an orderly is amazed at the condition of Danny's fingers. From the tips of his cuticles all the way to his first knuckle, they're completely flat, but the x-rays reveal that somehow not a single bone is broken. He is bandaged up and given heavy painkillers and sent back home. Day 25 of 28. George wakes up early in the morning to realize that a passing storm has shattered several of the home's windows, and he starts nailing plastic sheets and some old boards over the broken windows to keep cold air from freely flowing into the house. George also invites some local paranormal investigator units to examine the home. I mean, it can't hurt. The investigators ask to walk the family dog around each room, Harry, to see how the dog would react. What was interesting is once he got to a certain room, the sewing room, Harry refused to go in. He growled, and his hair on the back of his back stood up on end, and no matter how hard they pulled, they could not get him to go near that door. Day 26. After having a strange dream about a hooded figure with no face, and bony fingers. Mm. 
George wakes up in the middle of the night, screaming, I'm coming apart! What the hell is going on in my home? Missy then wanders into his room and says that Jody wants to talk to you, Dad. George runs to Missy's room and sees red glowing eyes as clear as day staring at him from outside Missy's window. Missy points at them. Look! There! There's Jody right there! He wants to come inside. We need to let him inside. Kathy runs in screaming. Gra into the, the yeah. Kathy comes in screaming to his daughter's room. She picks up a chair and throws it and shatters the window. And they hear this high-pitched animal squeal like a pig being slaughtered. The red eyes vanish. Later, Missy tells her mom that Jody told her about the little boy who also lives in her room. Jody told her that this little boy got sick and died in the room many, many years ago. But Jody says it's all okay. Jody says that Missy can live in the house forever, and that way she can always play with the little boy. <laughs> Kathy is in tears, terrified that her daughter is about to be next and die if they don't get out of this house. Day 27. Late in the evening, George wakes up to Kathy speaking in different voices in languages. Late in the evening, Kathy wakes up to George. That makes more sense. Late in the evening, Kathy wakes up to George speaking in different voices in languages Kathy has never heard him speak before. He's in some sort of trance. And then George clear as day suddenly screams in English over and over again. It's in Chris's room. It's in Chris's room. George remembers a dream about a dark presence, an entity in Chris's room before falling into his trance. He was dreaming about a hooded figure picking his son up and taking him away forever. George finally agrees to leave the house. He wants to leave that night. But maybe it was happenstance or bad luck. A massive storm had settled into the area, freezing, pouring rain down so hard that they decided to spend one last night in the house and wait out the storm. Missy, George, and Kathy all slept in George and Kathy's bed. And of course, the dog Harry wanted to guard inside on the door. Mm -hmm. But Danny and Chris, Danny and Chris chose to sleep in their own rooms that night. That night, George hears noises from that night, George hears noises from the boys' room. It sounds like the boys' beds are slamming as hard as possible against the walls. He tried to get up, but then all of a sudden he realized he was paralyzed and couldn't move his body. I, I can't, I can't move. Then on the dresser drawers began to open and close randomly. He heard all the doors and the windows in the house started to open and shut violently. Suddenly he hears a voice. So many voices coming from the living room, chanting something, but he can't move. Then he feels something in the bed, something on the bed now, but he, I can't see it. Something started to step on him. He felt it. It felt like hooves, many hooves walking towards his face. And then he passed out. The morning of day 28. Around 7 a.m., Kathy and George both awoke to hear Chris and Danny burst through their room in tears, screaming about a monster with no face trying to attack them last night. Suddenly, Harry, the dog, jumps up and started to snarl and growl at the door, going towards the hallway. George threw himself off the bed, finally able to move, and made his way to the hallway. When he got to the hallway and looked up, he stood, frozen with all the blood in his body, leaving. There stood a hooded figure from his nightmares across the hallway on the other end of the staircase. It was standing down, just staring at him. Then it raised its cloak and it showed its bony fingers and pointed right at him. George yelled at his family, we gotta get the hell out of this house. Run, run, get the hell out of this house. Everyone out of the house now. The Lutz family frantically bolted out the door, climbed into the, the van, and sped down the road, never to return to the house again. And that was the story 
of Amityville. The real story that inspired most of the haunted stuff we hear today. They made it out. They did. I'm shocked. And if you research it with all the bias, if you research it with all the bias, like the stuff I researched, all that happened in their mind, and they actually, 100%, they never went back to the house. That part was 100% factually checked. How'd they, they get any of their stuff? They out? got a moving company. They paid people. To, they would not go back in the house. So that happened. So what makes this insanely creepy to me, like there's so many, like, because it happened. Like, that's what's so weird. Like, there was a murder that happened that no one can explain. Mm-hmm. That happened, guys. That part happened. Then what I told you is what they said happened to them. Mm-hmm. So what's about like the part one of the story is like the murders that happened. Part three happened, which was they left that house randomly and never went back. They just left. Never went back. So part one and part three is happened. Part two is what they said happened. Right. That's what's creepy about this thing. There's enough true here. That's really fucking weird. Like what happened? Yeah. And if I kept saying like random crap happened that no one else heard. Yeah. Yeah. That's terrifying. And Jody. And just like the idea of like, I don't know. Like, Jody, oh, the that, big girl. That story freaks me out like a lot. It's just because there's enough truth in there to like. I don't. Yeah. You know, and I just watched The Conjuring just recently. You know, the episode about that specific house. I'm pretty sure that's what the, the episode was about. That family that moved in there. And there's something about watching that that movie and then hearing the story. It's like enough that is passed down and then relayed on. Is It's, it's real enough. It's real enough that it's absolutely horrifying and it's, it's just chilling to the bone and you can't. Because, fun fact, because I did this research, Ed and Lorraine are real people. Yeah. They actually went to the Amityville house. Yeah. And that's again, like, this is a place you can go to now. Yeah. It happened. It was real. For better or worse, like, most, a lot of this was real. And so, like, that's what makes it more creepy is there's enough there to make it, like, your brain's like, shit. I cannot just, like, guess this away. No. How does that many people get slaughtered in a house without a silencer or drugs involved and not wake up? Right. If I take a shotgun and start blowing people away, someone would be frantic. They it's were all, it was, yeah. That's how. And the fact that there were that, like, like just the cold and the weather and the flies, like, there was something bad in this. There was something insidious in that house. Yep. And, like, that is creepy. And the fact that even the guy that committed the murders is like, hey, I heard voices. Right. I, I don't know. Oof. But. Yeah. Good story, right? That was horrifying. Yeah. That that was horrifying. Um, all you needed, honestly, though, if they had a Derek and a Ouija board, I think a lot of things could have been solved. Or they just talked to him. Yeah, they could have totally <laughs> talked to to Jody through that window. No problems. <laughs> She's terrible. <laughs> uh, so the prank I'm going to play on her guys in this next week is no. put red eyes in the window and just see. No. No. Do you think Jojo would protect you from like something yes, like that? Jojo would protect me. No, yeah, no, wait, 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 I'm out. He'd be like, I'm out. Jojo would be like, I'm out. Jojo I am not like, doing shit about that. And I wake up in the middle of the night and be like, it's okay. Go back to sleep. Shh. Just like I do our day. <laughs> you say bread eyes, it's okay. Go back to sleep. That'd be you. Shh. You'd sleep through the evil things. I'd be the one out with Jojo. Like, yeah. holy motherfucker, we gotta get out of here. Tom You're be like, like <laughs> Tom be like, it's time to get out. And I just be like, <laughs> it's fine. It's fine. You know, I'm carrying your ass, just like just no, you hitting he, each staircase. He wouldn't, he thud, wouldn't thud, carry thud, my thud. ass. He would just he would just leave. <laughs> <laughs> they wouldn't bother you. I wake up. The, I'd wake up in the morning and be like, "Where's Tom and Juju? <laughs> Go back to sleep." That's probably not wrong. Uh, house notes. Um, we have the winners for all of our contests, and we will be. Uh, thank you guys so much for all of you guys that responded and left us reviews. That was really awesome of you guys. Um, You'll be giving out your gift cards. Um, we also have a new fun thing that Carly and I decided to do. For each of you that messages the show at spiritsandghoststories at gmail.com, we will give you a $10 gift card to Amazon. Um, we just really want to bolster the community and get you guys to like want to talk to us about stuff. And listen, you can hate on us. You can give us compliments. It's fine. Or you can give us suggestions for topics. Yeah. If you guys give us suggestions for topics, we will increase the gift card we give you. So yeah. please just reach out to us at spirit 
or uh, spirits and ghost stories at gmail.com. Yep. That's the one. And that'll be all in the, in the description of the episode, wherever you digest our content. Mm -hmm. But again, I hope you guys enjoyed the story tonight. Happy Halloween. Have a great time with your loved ones. Take your kids trick or treating. Go trick or treating. Go to a haunted Get house or a corn maze. This year. Yeah. Come on. Have a great time. It's one of the best holidays there is, mm -hmm. besides like maybe Christmas and Thanksgiving. But guys, happy holidays and happy Halloween from me and Carly here at Spirits and Ghost Stories. We'll see you next time. See you guys. Bye. Bye.